Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce our uh, visiting speaker today, Kevin O'Leary. He's a graduate of the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, uh, for his undergrad degree, and then took his uh, medical degree, AOA, at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, he then went on to internship and residency at Northwestern, and they've been fortunate to retain him at Northwestern ever since, first as an instructor, assistant professor, associate professor, and now a full professor. Uh, along the way, he also uh, obtained a master's uh, in, of science in healthcare quality and patient safety. He serves as associate chair for quality in the Department of Medicine and chief of the division of hospital medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. Uh, he's very well uh, published. I counted 64 uh, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, I always like to see how people get their start. And after a, a slight detour on fatal pseudomembranous colitis as his first case report, his second paper in kind of establishing a theme was on evidence-based approach to perioperative care and update for primary care physicians and he's really established himself as a leader in patient care and quality. He's also published six book chapters. He's received ongoing funding, currently receiving AHRQ funding, funding from Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Illinois, and the Illinois Surgical Quality Improvement Collaborative. He's an active educator uh, at all levels and is a very good citizen, professionally uh, involved in the Society of Hospital Medicine, the American College of Physicians, the Society of General Internal Medicine, the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research, and the CDC. He's an assistant editor of the Journal of Hospital Medicine and a senior deputy editor for the Journal of Hospital Medicine, uh, more recently a senior deputy editor for the Journal of Hospital Medicine. Along the way, he's earned many awards, uh, including teaching awards, um, and more recently a national award for excellence in teamwork and quality improvement from the Society of Hospital Medicine and the Leap Ahead Award from the American Association of Physician Leadership. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, O'Leary has spoken broadly internationally on uh, topics as he's addressing today and we're really fortunate that he uh, took the drive north to visit us to provide grand rounds today entitled Improving Patient Outcomes Through Interprofessional Teamwork. Please join me in welcoming Dr. O'Leary. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was, uh, I, I'd forgotten about some of that, so that was, that was really, really helpful to, uh, to go over again. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for the invitation. We had a wonderful dinner last night, and thank you so much. Um, I had a great chance to catch up with my colleague and friend, Jeremy Smith. There he is. Uh, Jeremy and I and Shannon uh, O'Connor, now Smith, were co-interns at Northwestern 20 years ago. And um, so I'm a little bit nervous because Jeremy was also a junior faculty member with me at Northwestern, and he had some hard-hitting questions for Grand Round speakers. I, I think you have clinic, though. Is that right? You have to leave early? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to your departure a little bit, a little bit early. Um, I, so the title of the talk is Improving Patient Outcomes Through Interprofessional Teamwork. I want to say just a couple of comments about the title and just make sure uh, you've got, we've got all the same expectations. The first, we will talk about teamwork quite a lot, um, but I'm also going to spend a lot of time talking about systems and frameworks related to systems, and you'll see um, that there's, that's kind of a theme throughout this talk. The other thing that I want to mention is that the the research that I'm going to touch on, the examples that I'm going to go over, they all relate to acute care and hospital settings because I'm a hospitalist. That's, that's where I've done this work and, and the literature that I'm familiar with. But the teamwork principles that we'll go over are applicable wherever you practice. They're applicable to all settings, whether it's a cath lab, an outpatient practice, an endoscopy suite. Uh, my sincere hope is that you'll take something away from the principles that we're going over and be able to apply it to your setting. I have no financial relationships to disclose. This is what we're going to talk about uh, in our time together this morning. First, we'll talk about why collaboration and teamwork matter. We'll talk about uh, research that shows an association between teamwork-related concepts and patient outcomes. We'll talk about a teamwork framework. I'll introduce that and define some key teamwork concepts. We'll talk about barriers to teamwork, and there we're really going to emphasize the system barriers 
uh, that get in the way of teamwork. We'll talk a lot about interventions. And through that, I'll talk a lot about what we've done at Northwestern. I'm going to try to weave our experience through this talk, really mainly to tell a story of, of, uh, of how we did this, but I'll touch on uh, the work of others as well. And then we'll uh, have some conclusions and talk about some future directions. So collaboration and teamwork, why is this so important? I want to make sure that we're all thinking about the team in the same way. So for the purpose of this presentation, I want us to think about the team from the patient's perspective. So think about a patient in a hospital bed uh, at the VA hospital or at the UW hospital, and think about all the people taking care of those patients. The, of course, in an academic medical center, we have residents, we have interns, we have an attending supervising, the house staff, and we have medical students. And I would call that the primary service physician team or sub-team. But there are other people who are taking care of the patient. Of course, there's the nurse. The nurse spends more time with the patient than we do. And nurses often work with other nursing-related team members. In our hospital, we call them patient care technicians, but you may use a different term. There are lots of other people taking care of the patient as well. There's physical therapists and respiratory therapists and pharmacists and social workers, and there's specialist consulting services and entire teams of specialists with a fellow, an attending, a resident, students. Patients leave their primary unit and may go to a diagnostic area or procedural area where an entirely different team takes care of the patient for a period of time before they come back to their uh, primary unit. And even if they're not physically present all the time, family members and the primary care physician are really critical members of the team. I want you to take a mental snapshot of this picture. I'm going to ask you to recollect it later, but my, my point here is to just make sure that we're all thinking about the team from the patient's perspective. So let's talk about the importance of teamwork. Teamwork is important for a variety of reasons. First, we spend a lot of our time on communication and coordination of care, teamwork-related activities. Time-motion studies of nurses and physicians and hospital settings find that we spend about a quarter of our time on these activities. Observational research shows that hospitals with higher ratings of teamwork tend to have higher nurse retention, which is important because it's really hard to recruit and retain great nurses. And observational research also shows that higher ratings of teamwork, hospitals with that have higher patient satisfaction. That's important because we're all working on improving patient satisfaction and patient experience. But the set of outcomes that I think is most tightly linked to, to teamwork are those related to patient safety. So there's an entire body of literature showing an association between communication and communication failures and adverse events or measures of patient safety. Communication, of course, is, is an essential feature of teamwork. I'm going to give you just three examples here. The first is a study by Sutcliffe and colleagues at the University of Michigan. Uh, years ago, they, this was a qualitative study. They interviewed residents in a variety of different specialties and asked them to describe the mishaps in which they had recently been involved. They didn't know what themes would emerge, but by far the dominant theme was communication failure involved in 91% of the mishaps that the residents described. The Joint Commission, as we all know, asks us to report sentinel events. Sentinel events are uh, adverse events that result in, in serious injury. They ask us to perform root cause analyses on these sentinel events, and they've tracked this data. And look, when they looked at over 3,000 sentinel events from 1995 to 2005, uh, communication failure was involved in over two-thirds of them. They've updated this data, and it's the same pattern. And then finally, uh, another observational study showed uh, higher ratings of collaboration on the part of nurses were associated with lower risk-adjusted mortality rate. And that's the first time that I'm going to introduce this theme that you're going to hear me emphasize, this uh, perception of collaboration on the part of nurses, which brings me to a question. I have, this is old school audience, audience response system. So uh, just by a show of hands, how many physicians would rate the quality of collaboration with nurses in your hospital as very low? How about low? Neutral? High? Very high. Good, okay. Um, let me flip that around. How would your nurses rate the quality of collaboration with physicians? Now, I'm not going to ask you because the overwhelming majority are here are physicians. Do we have any nurses here? OK, great. Thank you for coming. Um, maybe we'll talk later about how you would, would, would answer this question. We don't want to embarrass anybody. But, but I'm going to get back to this uh, in a little bit. 
First, let me introduce a teamwork framework. Um, when we were first starting to work on this, we wanted to get a better understanding of what is teamwork and what, uh, what are all the features of effective teamwork. We looked at the work of Eduardo Salas. He is a, a researcher who did, um, looked at teams in aviation, the military, uh, high reliability organizations like nuclear power plants, and developed this framework. Now, you may be familiar with the Team Steps framework. That framework is an extrapolation of this. And so he defined four, five, uh, f five core components of teamwork. The first is team leadership. The team leader effectively directs team members, assigns roles and responsibilities, clarifies tasks, helps resolve conflict. Mutual performance monitoring is the ability of one team member to monitor another's performance and then anticipate their needs and, if needed, to provide backup behavior to help them out. Adaptability is the notion that the team is getting information about its performance, and if they're not on track, they'll adjust their strategy to get back on track. And then team orientation is the practice of team members putting the team's goals ahead, or ahead of their own. That's the idea that uh, there's no I in team sort of, sort of component. Now, when all of these things are present, the, the team uh, achieves a shared mental model. A shared mental model is an organizing knowledge of the tasks of the team and how the team members will interact to accomplish those tasks. Sometimes people say this is like uh, being on the same page, reading from the same script. Uh, I think a good way to illustrate this is with a picture. So if you Google shared mental model, this is the picture that, that you'll find. So let me just walk you through this. There are four people here that are really concerned with something that is apparently dangerous, toxic. They're in their hazmat suits. This one's so skittish he won't even touch the area with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> this guy, his area is, his attention is focused on getting his picture taken, and he is not at all concerned with whatever is going on down here. He, is, he has a different mental model than the others, right? The other thing that teams create when they're doing a good job is situational awareness. That's the ability of a team to pick up on potential threats <laughs> to, to the team's performance. I think this one's self-explanatory. Um, now, how do they achieve that? They achieve that, one of the ways is through closed-loop communication. This is an example of communication that's not closed-loop and could be going on in our hospital right now despite all of the work that we've done on this. There's a physician in one part of the hospital returning a page from a nurse in another part of the hospital, and the physician says, you page me? And the nurse says, Mr. Jones has more pain. The physician says, let's increase his hydromorphone to 4Q2, and the nurse says, okay. Now, I hope that that looks problematic to you. Um, we're doing okay for time, so I don't know if anybody wants to shout out what, what they feel is vague about this. Read back. Read back. Yeah, I mean, we don't... There, there's no confirmation that the two understand the order in the same way, right? Now, I use the word, mis I use Mr. Jones not just because it's a generic name, but there are times when we have two patients by the same last name. There's an assumption that they're talking about the same Mr. Jones, but we don't know. Uh, there's also an assumption that the physician knows why Mr. Jones has more pain, but I, we don't know if this is new pain, different pain, worse pain. Uh, we don't know if the hydromorphone is IV or PO. I think it's PRN, but I'm not sure. And I don't know who's putting in the order. Is the nurse taking a verbal order, or is the physician going to put in the order? We don't know. What if it went like this? Physician is returning a page from a nurse. Physician says, this is Dr. Sheehy. I was paged. And Anne would do this because she understands how important closed-loop communication is. Uh, nurse says, Mr. Jones has more pain. Physician says Mr. William Jones in 1302 has more pain, realizes that he needs to clarify that they're talking about the same patient. The nurse says, correct. Physician says, yes, I just saw him, implying I've assessed his pain. Uh, we're on the same page with regard to that. I'm putting in an order for hydromorphone 4Q2. Now we know who's putting in the order. Now the nurse reads back her understanding of the order and says they're increasing the hydromorphone from 2 milligrams IV Q2 hours to PRN to 4 milligrams IV Q2 hours PRN. The physician says, yes. That's right. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a lot of hydromorphone. <laughs> All the more reason why they should be on the same page, right? Now, but it doesn't usually go that way, right? And in fact, there's evidence to say that it often doesn't occur at all. So this is um, two similar studies, one that we did at Northwestern where we were trying to characterize this situation and one done at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. Very similar methods, so I just put them together, the results, where we randomly selected patients and we interviewed the nurse and the physician at the end of the day about their patient. We asked the nurse, so enough time for communication to occur if it were to occur. We asked the nurse, do you know the name of any of the primary service physicians taking care of this patient? Have you communicated with them? And if so, how did you do it? Asked the physician the same thing. Nurses knew the name of the physician taking care of the patient 40 to 70% of the time. Physicians knew the name of the nurse far less often. They reported communicating with one another 50 to 60% of the time. Bless you. Uh, Two-thirds of the time that was face-to-face, -face, but a third of the time that was just a brief phone call or a text page. I don't know how you feel about this, 50 to 60% of the time. If, if that doesn't strike you as odd, let me tell you that we also interviewed patients. I didn't put it on the slide, but we asked them, do you think that your nurse and hospital physician should communicate about your plan of care every day? I mean, it's kind of a ridiculous question. We got the strangest looks. Like, why are you asking? Are they not? I mean, but <laughs> no, they weren't. And what that translates into is lack of a shared mental model. So we, in this study, what we also asked, we asked the physician, what diagnosis landed this patient in the hospital? What tests are planned for the day? What procedures? What medication changes? And we wrote down verbatim exactly what they said. We asked the nurse the same questions, and we wrote down verbatim what they said, and then we looked for agreements. And we accounted for uh, differences in terminology. So if the nurse said the patient was admitted for fainting and the physician said syncope, we said that's the same thing. We gave them credit for, for full agreement. But even with that flexibility, a quarter of the time there was no agreement between the nurse and the physician for diagnosis, a quarter of the time for plain tests. You can see the other results there. They, they lacked a shared mental model. So again, we were trying to put together, we're trying to characterize the situation because we had a notion that this was something that we needed to work on the other thing that we did was we did a, a survey of all the nurses, physicians, social workers, and all the consulting service physicians on during a period of time. And we, we used something called the safety attitude questionnaire, and then we also had a simple question where we asked respondents to rate the quality of collaboration that they had experienced with other professional types. And we compared dyads, and I'm showing you this dyad because this is the dyad that was most discrepant. So the bars in this graph show the, the, per, the percentage in one professional type rating the quality of collaboration in the other of, with the other as high or very high quality. So you can see that residents on the teaching service, 72% of them felt the collaboration with nurses was going really well, but only 35% of nurses felt the collaboration with physicians was going really well. Same story on the hospital service. Physicians thought collaboration was really going well and nurses disagreed. We were shocked because for years we had been telling ourselves that we were more mature, more stable, understood the importance of communication, but same story. I want to just mention that this same sort of study has been done repeatedly. This isn't just a Northwestern medicine story. In other settings, when you look at you know, ICUs, operating rooms, in, in different hospitals, it's this dyad that is most strained, the nurse-physician dyad, and you see the same results over and over again, where physicians think collaboration is going well and nurses disagree. So this is how we put it all together. There is ineffective communication. That then leads to an incomplete understanding of the plan of care, a lack of a shared mental model. That then becomes the norm. People don't even realize that they have incomplete information and so they don't seek out additional information. That all contributes to a system which has limited ability to catch or prevent errors before they reach the patient. Now, no one comes to work saying, um, you know what, I'm not going to communicate effectively today. I, it's just not my thing. The, the, we all value teamwork. We all realize it's important for patient care. The problem is that stuff gets in the way. So when we were working on this, and we went back to the literature by Eduardo Salas and Lemieux Charles and others. These are researchers that had mainly looked at teams in uh, aviation, military, outside of healthcare. They said wherever they looked, the same three things seemed to get in the way. First was team size. Sometimes the team is too small, but more often it's too big. 
Team membership instability, that's uh, the practice of team members joining and departing from the team as the team is doing its work. And the last is dispersion of team members in time and space. When we looked at this, again, the, the, the research was mainly outside of healthcare. We said, that sounds like exactly what we've created in healthcare. If you remember the team size, remember that, I asked you to take that mental snapshot of the patients in the middle and all of those people around the patient. It's a huge team. And that's really just a snapshot in time. All of those team members are turning over throughout a 24-hour cycle and, and day to day because we provide care 24-7. Resident is leaving for the day, might have a day off, might be in clinic, might rotate on and off service, nurses leave for the day, etc. So there's team membership instability, and then there's dispersion of team members too. Now I know that you've done a lot of work uh, on all the things that I'm touching on, but I'll do another old school audience response system. A resident in your hospital typically has patients on how many different units? How many say A, one to two? And, I, and you can respond to your setting, whether you're in the VA or, or at your main hospital. How about three to four? Okay. Five to six? Okay. Seven, eight? Two or more buildings? That's pretty good. That's really good. Um, there are, I'm going to show you data later that uh, there are many, many hospitals. It's just kind of the practice in medicine that we've dispersed our, our physicians throughout the entire um, institution. This is what life looked like for me before January of 2008. I might have a patient on 14 West. I could have another patient on 14 West. I could have a patient on 14 East. In fact, I could have patient on, patients on nine different units on five different floors, and some of those floors were separated by other floors. And it was really hard for me to collaborate with the nurses and the social workers who were mainly unit-based. Another hospitalist on at the same time would have an entirely different distribution of patients and the same issue trying to collaborate with the unit-based staff. Let's talk about some interventions. Um, the, when we looked at this years ago, uh, we went to the literature. We, we had kind of characterized our problem and then went to the literature to try to figure out you know, what people had tried. And to this day, you can really categorize the interventions into these um, in this fashion. So teamwork training, there's a lot of research and publications on teamwork training, but most of it is outside of medicine. It's in operating rooms. Uh, labor and delivery, emergency medicine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's one study that's looked at teamwork training in medicine. Geographic localization of physicians, I know that's something that you're working on here. There's a growing body of literature related to that that I'll go over. Unit-based co-leadership, I know that you have a dyad model here. Uh, I'll touch on that and, and how we did it at Northwestern. And daily goals of care forms and checklists. That's, those are structured communication tools. It's really fascinating to me that these are tools that have been used in operating rooms and intensive care units, settings in which the team members have been in the same place at the same time for years, but were not on the same page until they had a structured communication tool to organize their thoughts. And then interdisciplinary rounds, which exist in most hospitals, but I would argue in most hospitals they haven't really, they've evolved rather than have been intelligently designed. I know here that's not the case. And then I'm going to spend a good deal of time talking about how these interventions may complement one another, and really that's probably the approach that we should be taking. So first let me talk about this teamwork training study. This was done by uh, Neeraj Siegel and uh, Andy Auerbach at UCSF. They put internal medicine residents, hospitalists, nurses, pharmacists, case managers, and social workers through four hours of teamwork training, uh, included a variety of different methods, didactics, video and debriefing, low fidelity simulation. The participants loved it. Um, but they really don't know whether any of those behaviors translated into the clinical setting. I would argue that um, if you improve my skills, uh, and my skills need to be improved just like anybody else, if you improve my teamwork skills, but I'm hardly ever in the same place at the same time with the other team members, it, we're not going to get that far. Um, these things probably need to be complemented. Again, this is what life looked like for us before January of 2008. Beginning in January of 2008, we did this. And I know that, again, I know that you're working on this here too and have done this. But we simply asked the bed assignment department to change from assigning a service first and a bed later to assigning a bed first, and then we would tell them what service and what physician was going to admit the patient on that unit. And this is what it looks like even to this day, where on uh, 13, there are six teams that have Roughly half of their patients on 13 West, half of their patients on 13 East. 
two units on the same floor. It's not one unit, but two units is so much better than nine units. And then this other one is also kind of a primary and secondary unit kind of model. There's a lot of other people who have been doing this, and, and there's a growing list of publications uh, looking at localization. And here's kind of a summary of what they find. Uh, there's an increased recognition of team members. So the team members are better able to name one another, and, and you can imagine that that's probably a surrogate for a better relationship. There's a change in communication patterns. So there's increased frequency of face-to-face -face nurse commu physician communication and a reduction in pages, which I think is a good thing. So we're changing from asynchronous uh, communication with a method that's relatively less effective than synchronous communication that's face-to-face -face and, and more effective. But even more importantly, it provides the foundation for other interventions, uh, which I'm going to talk about. But just one example is interdisciplinary rounds. If we ask physicians to show up to interdisciplinary rounds on seven units, they, they can't. But if we ask them to do that on one or two units, then, then that's feasible. So I'm going to tell you about um, a project that we did and some results. Uh, this was called Interact. Uh, after we localized our physicians to specific units, we put into place two other components. The first is unit-based co-leadership, similar to your dyad model, and structured interdisciplinary rounds. Uh, the unit co-leadership for us involved the creation of a, un a new role, the unit medical director, which we hadn't had before. Uh, we selected them in collaboration with the nursing leadership. They had, uh, I think, 20% protected time when we started. Now they have 15%. Most of what I'm going to talk about is a pilot that we did with the results that I'm going to show you where we did this on one teaching service unit and one hospitalist unit, and now we've expanded this. Uh, in the co-leadership training, we had the uh, nurse manager and the, and the unit medical director uh, go through an exercise defining and clarifying their roles and where they overlapped and where they were distinct. We also put them through Six Sigma training. We put them through simulation-based training to help them facilitate interdisciplinary rounds. Structured interdisciplinary rounds combines a structured communication tool with regular interdisciplinary meetings. The nurse manager and unit medical director were to facilitate the discussion. One is supposed to be present every single day. Um, usually both are there. All the nurses, the bedside nurses, the physicians, the pharmacists, the social workers, and the case managers were expected to attend. Those were the parameters that we set. But then I think the most important part is down at, at the bottom where for each of these Units, we put together frontline professionals and working groups to help us. They really determined the optimal format, frequency, duration, and best use of the communication tool. And what they came up with on the pilot units is what we still use today, which is uh, this happens in the late morning. Um, we talk about every single patient on the unit. We use a structured communication tool for the newly admitted patients, but we talk about the old ones too. And this lasts about 30 to 40 minutes. And we do it in a conference room. There, were a lot, there was a lot of discussion about doing it at the bedside. We did it at a conference room, and we still do. This is the uh, communication, the structured communication tool that they put together. And you can see this is organized uh, in overall plan of care, discharge plans, patient safety, bless you. Um, this doesn't get filled out. This is really just a guideline for the discussion. We also realized that all of the people coming to interdisciplinary rounds had their own tools. So the physicians had something that they printed from the EHR. The nurse had something. So we created something for the unit co-leaders that identified opportunities to improve patient safety and patient care. So for this patient, it identifies that this patient is a new patient. If the physician forgets to use the structured communication tool, the unit co-leader will push that paper under them to help remind them. Down here at the bottom, you can't read this, but it says that this patient has a central line. So if no one's talking about the central line during IDR, then the unit co-leader knows to bring it up and ask if we still need it. This patient also is not on VT chemoprophylaxis and even shows the INR if the patient has one, so the unit co-leader can decide to bring that up if no one's talking about it. Here are our results. Um, we were disappointed, but we didn't see an improvement on length of stay and cost. Um, in retrospect, our length of stay was pretty good to begin with. You know, and when we look at UHC, it's always been about one or below one in the observed to expected ratio. So we weren't too, we didn't lose any sleep on that. The professionals rated the interventions favorably. They actually thought that this improved the efficiency of their workday, which we were really pleased to see. And then we found significant improvements in the ratings of collaboration and teamwork. Again, we used the safety attitudes questionnaire, but I'm showing you the ratings of collaboration. 
On two control units where we didn't have these interventions, you can see that physicians still think that collaboration is going really well and nurses still disagree. On the intervention units, the nurses were, now 76% of them felt that collaboration was higher, very high quality. I didn't put a p-value here, but it's statistically significant. The other thing that we uh, found when we observed these interdisciplinary rounds is these conversations that we've called nice catch conversations. And I'm going to give you just three quick examples here. The first is a physician who had been uh, following a patient for days, had been in the hospital for a while. The patient had new dyspnea one day, and the physician said, this patient has new dyspnea, is at risk for a PE, so I ordered a CT pulmonary angiogram. And the nurse said, well, actually, the patient has a documented allergy to contrast. The physician said, no, I think that's just topical iodine. I don't think we need to worry about that. The nurse said, well, I just came out of his room, and he told me this story about he was at another hospital, and he woke up intubated in the ICU shortly after a CAT scan with contrast. And she said it like kind of sheepishly, like, do you think that's important? You know? <laughs> and yeah, you know, that was an opportunity for all, us, all of us to say thank you so much. That obviously changed our plans for that patient. Second example, pharmacist said to the physician, the PTT is 63. Do you want to adjust the heparin rate? The physician said, no, my goal PTT is 60 to 80 and looked really puzzled. It had been 60 to 80 for years. This, was a while ago, this example, but had been 60 to 80 for a long time. The pharmacist said, well, actually, we adjusted the therapeutic range in our hospital six months ago. The new therapeutic range is 65 to 110. There were five hospitalists that had come to IDR that day. Three of them did not know the right therapeutic range for our hospital, and we concluded that if the hospitalists don't know the therapeutic range, there's probably a lot of other people who don't know the right therapeutic range. We went to IT and then changed some of the decision support for heparin. Uh, last example, this was on the teaching service. A uh, resident physician said, this patient was transferred out of the CCU. She had a cardiac arrest, and she's awaiting uh, ICD placement. And nurse pointed out that the patient was not on telemetry. And the resident, after she uh, almost got off the floor, after falling out of her chair, said, uh, yes, I want her on telemetry. She's really high risk for another uh, arrest, and you know, we, that would be unforgivable, really. So the nurse immediately left to put on telemetry and the physician put in the order. But you can you get the idea of these things that we were catching. So then we decided to look at this more rigorously and um, did a, a chart review. We used the IHI trigger tool, which is, you may or may not be familiar with it. It's a very rigorous, time-consuming, but um, probably really the gold standard to look for adverse events. We randomly selected 185 patients on a controlled teaching service unit and 185 patients on the intervention teaching unit. And we found 63 adverse events, and that was 185, an adverse event rate of 7.2 per 100 patient days on the control, and 35 adverse events, 3.9 adverse events per 100 patient days on the intervention unit, an adjusted incidence rate ratio of 0.54. I'm not going to show you, but we also uh, looked at the same unit pre-post and had essentially nearly identical results. This is mainly driven by adverse events that are deemed preventable. Fortunately, the number of preventable adverse events that result in serious harm is relatively low, and we weren't really able to look at that, but we were really encouraged by this finding. Um, just to give you a sense of the type of adverse events that I'm talking about, the most common type of adverse event on a medical unit is an adverse drug event, and those were significantly reduced as a result of this. Uh, the other adverse events occurred relatively less frequently. When we pooled them together, we also showed um, a reduction. So I want to just pause for a second and um, say that you know when, when we first started approaching this, it was all kind of in the context and using frameworks uh, related to teamwork. But um, really what we did was we put into place a multifaceted system redesign you know, the, the localization, the unit co-leadership, the interdisciplinary rounds, things that you're doing too. And I think that systems approach is really helpful in thinking about how, uh, how we can redesign systems to improve care. Uh, we really targeted the hospital unit, which is a clinical microsystem, which is defined as the small group of people who work together in a defined setting on a regular basis to provide care. That's a concept that I'm sure is familiar to you because you all work in clinical microsystems all the time. Again, a, an outpatient clinic, a dialysis unit, a cath lab, those are all microsystems. In hospital settings, microsystems coexist with other microsystems. There are other hospital units, the emergency department, the ICU, procedural suites, diagnostic and testing areas. 
These are all clinical microsystems which then make up a meso system. They, the, the function on the microsystem is really important and the connections between the microsystems are really important. And then you can, of course, think about this in the larger context of different meso systems that together make up a macro system, a health system, or a network. Um, but I think that this approach is really, really important. That's where we're kind of focusing our energy now as a research team. When we look at the literature, there are um, people that have looked at high reliability organizations, uh, again, nuclear power plants, aircraft carriers, uh, areas where there's a lot of risk, but exceptional performance. Um, in healthcare as well, there are some, uh, some positive deviance. When we look at those high reliability or high value organizations, one of the things that they do is they deliberately design microsystems to optimize their performance. And we know from the research of others what factors are associated with the success of a microsystem. And here they are. The first is local leadership. Second is focus on the needs of staff, trying to remove barriers from the system to allow staff to, to do the best work that they can. Bless you. Uh, emphasis on the needs of patients, attention to performance, the, the availability of performance data so that the microsystem knows how it's performing, and a rich information environment, sharing that performance data, making sure that communication is, is occurring uh, seamlessly. These concepts, I think, are probably sounding really familiar to you now. Um, they've been put together um, they're the same concepts that we used in our approach that you're using here and that Jason Stein and others have put together in this approach called the Accountable Care Unit Model uh, or the Accountable Care Team Model. Uh, the components are unit-based teams, so geographic localization, unit level nurse and physician co-leadership, kind of like the dyad model, structured interdisciplinary bedside rounds, so one of the differences between uh, this model and the one that we used is that they really emphasize that interdisciplinary rounds should be done at the bedside, and then unit level performance reporting. There's a growing number of publications on this model. Most are descriptive, but Kara and colleagues recently implemented this at, the in at Indiana University and had a really interesting study design where they looked at the, they implemented this across a range of units in their hospital, and they looked at the fidelity of implementation, the, the degree to which implementation of these components was successful and compared that to patient outcomes. And what they found was that the degree of implementation of the model was associated with improved length of stay and cost. Interestingly, it wasn't associated with an improvement in patient satisfaction, and unfortunately, they didn't look at uh, patient safety. You might wonder, well, how common is this? You, you know, you have these components in place and you're, and you're working to um, get them even further in place. Uh, this is data from, this is unpublished, but this is a survey that we did last summer of internal medicine program directors and hospital medicine group leaders um, trying to find out through the country how often these things are in place. So it, it's highly variable. There are a third, you know, 30 to 40 percent of hospitals across the country have their physicians on greater than five units on a, five or more units on a typical day. There are about a, a third or greater uh, hospitals with no co-leadership model on any of the units on their medicine services. Relatively few don't have interdisciplinary rounds on any of their units, but, of the, but there are some, and of those that have interdisciplinary rounds, the nurse is present or expected to be present only about two-thirds of the time. And then at the bottom you see that about 50% of hospitals have unit data available at the unit level. So I want to talk about uh, future directions and then, and then we'll draw some conclusions and save some time for question and answer. Uh, I think that the, the, the biggest area that we're going to see a lot of change in the years to come is in communication technology. Um, I think we're really right on the cusp of transformative change. To me, it's amazing that we still use pagers. We talked about this last night. I know you have a, a spoke pilot, but most of you have a pager on you, is that right? Um, I mean, we're the only profession in the world that still uses pagers, right? Drug dealers have gotten rid of pagers <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, we, we all have this other technology in our pockets, which is far more advanced and has so much more, um, so many more capabilities. And, and for that reason, there are studies showing that a lot in a lot of settings, 
physicians have gravitated toward using their, their own phones and standard text messaging for patient care related messages. Now there's uh, publications about that and, and the concerns, and most of the publications emphasize this concern around protected health information. But I think that's really only one of the potential concerns. There's no easy way for me when I finish the day or go home for the night or uh, when I rotate off service for me to forward my standard text messaging to you if you're now taking over my service. I, I can't do that. Um, and that raises the potential for missing urgent messages, missing messages when not on clinical duty. It's not designed for our, for a healthcare system. So there's this, been this explosion of third-party, uh, vendor-based, secure messaging, uh, mobile messaging applications. And I know that you're using Spoke. We're actually also kind of piloting Spoke, very similar story to yours. But this is a partial list. There are dozens, literally dozens. Uh, I think the technology matters, but I think the implementation matters even more. There's very little research on vendor-based secure mo mobile messaging applications. There's a couple studies. Um, really, most of what they look at is physician perceptions, and physicians like it. But that's really just scratching the surface of investigating uh, whether these would be beneficial and how. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Will the volume of messages and interruptions increase, decrease, stay the same? Will the mode of communication change from reducing face-to-face -face communication to just messaging, just in exchanging secure mobile messaging is better than unidirectional text messaging, but not as great as face-to-face -face communication. I think the biggest question is, what are the key features for effective implementation? We talked about this last night at dinner, where there really needs to be a, a, a critical mass of professionals on it in an institution for people to use it and find it helpful. And the nurses, should be on a system that works as well because half of the pages I get, if not more, are from nurses. So if I can't reply to the nurse, that's going to limit the, the utility. Um, and the final thing we talked a little bit about yesterday is the signal strength in the network really needs to be impeccable. So drawing some conclusions, uh, we talked about collaboration and teamwork, which are essential for safe and effective care. We may, especially as physicians, not be aware of the deficiencies the system barriers abound. It's almost as if our systems have evolved uh, to put up barriers to teamwork. But that also points in the direction of where we need to go for interventions to redesign the system. When we look at them as single interventions, they appear to be successful. But I think we're going to get further if we realize that they complement one another and that further research and, and work is, needs to be done on the use of complementary, mutually reinforcing interventions that redesign the systems of care in which our patients um, receive their care. Implementation requires adaptation for local factors. So the components, I think, are fairly generalizable, but the way any individual component is implemented here versus at Northwestern versus another hospital, I think that is going to be different because of the local needs and the local context. So I want to thank uh, all the people that I've worked on this. This is um, a partial list of the people that I've worked with. And I want to thank you very much for the invitation to come speak to you today. Thank you so much, Kevin. And, and I really appreciate you coming up to, to visit with us and the support that you provided uh, our division head, Ann Sheehy, and the rest of the team. I think this is a great example of collaboration uh, uh, among the major medical centers in the Midwest. So with that, I'll ask you to call on the audience and please uh, remember to repeat the question yeah. for the recording. Thanks. Questions, comments? This is my favorite part. Yeah, so you're talking about geographic localization and, and some of the constraints related to that specifically, I think. Is, is that right? So your question is, how did we get over some of the uh, systems uh, barriers to implementing localization of physicians? Is that, did I paraphrase that correctly? So we, some of the things that we were already doing facilitated this, um, which are, you know, things that, each institution needs to consider there's a trade-off uh, involved. So for example, we've had night float for years for the teaching service and for the hospital service, and about half of the patients are admitted at night 
for us anyway. So immediately half of the patients need to be handed off to someone else in the morning. So literally overnight, we could be 50% localized. Um, for the um, uh, for the hospitalists, we have we it's I don't want to get into too many technical details, but we also we have an admitter rounder system. So almost every patient is handed off to someone else, uh, and that helps facilitate it too. I really think that shooting for good and not perfection is key. So if you have physicians on two units or occasionally three units, that's so much better than seven units, and that's a huge step in the right direction. So I think that conceptually is an important piece. Other things that help us, um, we have centralized telemetry, so we don't have a whole lot of internal transfers for that. We don't have a step-down unit. We basically have an ICU and everything else, and everything else. We can have patients on telemetry, so we don't have internal transfers related to that. Um, there are other things, too, but I think I've, hopefully I've gotten to most of your question. Does that did I? Okay. Go ahead. So I'll, uh, I think it was a comment, but I'll, I'll comment on your comments and I'll paraphrase it. You were really reflecting on the ambulatory setting and that practice of exchanging messages, probably in epic, like inbox messages, which are asynchronous, uh, not face-to-face, -face, and that it sometimes takes a while for the communication and the decision to get resolved. I agree, and I don't work in an ambulatory setting, but maybe one thought would be a face-to-face -face touch base at a regular point every day or, you know, on Mondays I'm going to touch base with my nurse at 10 a.m. or, you know, after my morning patients on Tuesdays, you know, maybe some other plan. But that might be helpful. And I suspect that a lot of people don't think about doing that. Others probably instinctively do it. Um, but maybe deliberately designing face-to-face -face communication. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I think that any change in our communication technology needs to be studied. It, you know, if you think about all the research that's been done on the electronic health record, it, it's, it's huge. There's an entire body and lots of grants and, and federal funding dedicated to studying the implementation of EHRs and their effect. And there's very little attention to communication technology, which is a tool that we all use every day, all the time. And that's, I share your concern that we don't know whether putting into place a secure mobile messaging application is going to help hurt or make no difference with the quality and the effectiveness of the communication that we have. It probably very much depends on how it's implemented and the settings and the culture. But those are all things that we should investigate. Uh, yeah, we. that's a great question. Thank you very much. So to repeat that, uh, have we studied factors related to improving HCAPs? I didn't put, I took it out of the uh, presentation. I have the slide, but I think I'll just paraphrase it. Um, we, so one thing we, I mentioned that we don't do is we don't do it at the bedside. We did test that. Um, I'll say that we didn't implement it all that effectively. So that's part of the reason um, that I, I didn't share it with you, and it was a negative study. We didn't improve uh, any of the measures of patient-centeredness that we looked at, including patient satisfaction, concordance with uh, shared decision-making, and patient activation. Um, we tested that. That didn't really seem to make much of a difference, but we didn't implement it very well. Uh, we've looked at patient portals. I think that there's a huge potential for patient portals to improve engagement and information, and maybe patient experience, too. Uh, we haven't researched this, but I'll, I'll share with you a story that I shared last night. 
which is about three years ago, I was being called into meetings every other week about, you know, why are our patient experience scores in the 50th or 40th percentile? And we we're all kind of scratching our heads. And, and some of us remembered that it, a couple of years before, it was like 80, 90th percentile. And we we're trying to figure out what happened. Well, what happened in 2012 is we reduced nurse staffing quite a bit, and we changed from a unit-based nurse manager model to essentially reducing the number of nurse managers. We had a change in leadership. They reinstated this model. Our, our patient experience scores went back up. Now we're like 80th, 90th percent again. The, the, the observational research supports that. that uh, it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, so the approach needs to include multiple, multiple uh, components, but nurse staffing repeatedly is tightly associated with patient experience. Well, I expand more on the communication issues between nurses and physicians. Well, when he was assessed, physicians said they thought it was normal. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that part of it was we didn't give people an opportunity to, to I think the, the physicians perceived that they had the information that they needed from the nurse, even though there was additional, in my opinion, there was additional information they could have benefited from. And the nurses knew that they needed more information from the physicians, but they weren't getting it. So what we did was we created a forum for them to exchange information. And I think we improved the relationship because they now were actually looking at one another, knowing each other's names. It improved the relationship. Um, I think those were the, I think there are, you know, there's a, there's a culture for sure. Um, and I. In, in all organizations, and I think that what we did, the structures that we put into place helped change the culture from physicians sometimes thinking that, unfortunately, the, sometimes they think that the nurse exists to carry out their orders from someone to someone that they should collaborate with and, sh and, and share information to arrive at the best decisions on behalf of the patient. We didn't look at that. I think that's a great question. So to repeat your question, did we look at uh, gender concordance or discordance and how that affected perceptions of teamwork? We didn't. Uh, I think that would be a great, a great Did question. Feel any better? I had Eduardo Salas out here ten years ago, and he had looked at gender. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should start looking at that. Maybe if a woman had been. Uh, I think it's a great question, and and we might be able to do that with the data that we. It's kind of old now, but it might be worth taking a look. We haven't in the past. Uh, when we did this research, we didn't have a whole lot of APP presence on our medicine services. We do now. So um, we have been trying to, you know, we've mainly as a research team been focusing on kind of disseminating this beyond Northwestern. But, um, you know, there, there's always, for me, there's always a tension between continuing to work on what we need to work on internally and, um, and you know, spreading the, the good news too. So I think that would be a great thing for us to work on, but we haven't done it yet. Um, so to paraphrase your question, you know, we're very interested in patient-centered care. Um, I mentioned a, a little while ago that our efforts didn't really seem to improve patient satisfaction, and your question is, do we believe that, and what might explain that? Um, I, you know what? I will, I will show you these slides. So really quickly, I put it in here for the for because I anticipated a question like this. Um, Quickly, we, we put together this, these, we call them patient-centered bedside rounds, 
we designed this again with frontline input and we went to our patient family advisory council. One of the things that they told us, we proposed a, a big team going into the, to the patient's room, the pharmacist, the social worker, the nurse, the physician, and the patient family, our patient family advisory council said no. And pretty emphatically said, we want the nurse and the physician. So that's what we did. That's one potential explanation for why we didn't have a bigger impact. Um, we didn't show an improvement on these measures. I'm going to show you in a second, but we didn't implement this very well. You can see that it occurred on only 58% of the patients that we planned to have this. Now, we did a, both a uh, intention to treat and treatment received analysis, so looking at by unit, but also whether the patient actually received this. We didn't show a benefit. Um, and we looked at these different measures. So we looked at decision control concordance, patient activation, overall satisfaction. We looked at HCAPs. One of the reasons you can see that the confidence intervals here are huge. So one thing that I've found over and over again as I've tried to research patient experience and patient centeredness is that the effect size is pretty small. Uh, many of the patient satisfaction scores are positively skewed. And so in order to show a statistically significant difference, you need a huge sample size. Um, the other is I think it's a multifaceted problem, and we only implemented one component of an intervention. I think there's so many other things that patients are reflecting on uh, in addition to um, just their time in rounds. I, go ahead. That, thank you. So the question is, in what way did the rounds incorporate the patient in the discussion? We had a script. I didn't include it here, but we had a script that had uh, the physician's part, the nurse's part, and the patient's part. But I've listened to a lot of talks about interprofessional bedside rounds, and I don't know about you, but I've seen videos on YouTube about uh, patient-centered bedside rounds, and some of them, quite honestly, are, are kind of shocking. One in particular that I recall had four minutes where an entire team came in to see the patient. They all shared their information. The, at the end of four minutes, the patient said one word, and it was no, in response to the question, do you have any questions? <laughs> Which is not the way we should be asking, right? We should be saying, what questions do you have? And we should be engaging the patient. For us, we did an okay job. I'm sure we could have done a better job. But I think you've got a great point. The way you implement this is probably just as important, if not more important, than whether you're doing it or not. Yeah, so the question is, um, a lot of what we've touched on seems to potentially have created a, or changed the culture of receiving feedback, and, and uh, how has that gone? I think it's gone well. I mean, we in, in all of these, we're not necessarily singling out physicians. We're, we're giving aggregate data, uh, for the most part, to try to convince physicians that the, that the status quo was not okay and that there was this problem that, they weren't, that we weren't uh, aware of. Um, so like any other problem there's that, and any other change management, there's some people who are going to kind of refute the data and then as long as it's solid uh, and we uh, explain the data and, it, and you know, with a critical mass of believers, then people start getting on board. And, and what we did was we included people at every step. So we didn't... We didn't implement these solutions. I didn't come up with these solutions and say, on Monday, this is the way we're going to do it. Instead, we had this working group meet for 12 weeks before we went live. So we had input from the front line the whole time. And it worked well. In one of the first uh, interdisciplinary rounds, uh, somebody came in, one of the nurses came in and kind of rolled her eyes like, why are we doing this? And right next to her was one of the nurses who was on the nursing, on the working group. And she explained it to her. You know, she had the elevator speech <coughs> memorized. And that helped convince that nurse. And, and everyone got on board relatively quickly. With that, we'll have to close. I want to thank Dr. O'Leary for really an outstanding grand round. Pleasure.